I was diagnosed in January of 2016 after a mammogram came back with a little spot on it. My diagnosis was a lump on my right breast and uh, nobody really knows, I don't think, until they get in there and cut you open what their stage is and what their stuff is. I mean, they thought it was early stage because it wasn't very big. It was 1.5 centimeters, something like that. The diagnosis uh, was stage four, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, large cell B was the, was the diagnosis. And it was considered treatable, but incurable. So the doctor says, we can, we can get you into remission using chemo. And then the remission will be short and then it'll relapse. This is typically what happens. And then we can get you in remission again, maybe, and then it gets shorter until we can't get you in remission anymore. Um, I was never diagnosed with cancer, but my grandmother um, was diagnosed with breast cancer um, a year before I was born. Uh, she actually died a year before I was born. So yeah, I never got to actually meet her, but I've heard like wonderful stories about her. I was diagnosed with breast cancer on October 27th, 2017. Diagnosed then, it was triple negative. Um, the kind of worst of the, of the breast cancers, you know, they're all bad, but. That one doesn't have as many treatment options. The diagnosis was invasive ductal carcinoma, and they, they didn't really tell me a, a stage, which you know was a little bit odd. They, they said probably around 2B. I was supposed to do tw um, 16 rounds of chemo, 12 of Taxol, and then um, four of AC, just known as the Red Devil. And after three, rounds of Taxol, the tumor had, had kept growing. My doctor said, you know, it's time to get aggressive. So we stopped the Taxol and started on the AC, which is just really, really bad. And um, it, it did respond to that. I was diagnosed with uh, stage three cancer some in six years back. The world came down. You know, you realize or it strikes me or it slaps on your face to say, now you need to change your, uh, you know, way you look at life, you do things, your attitudes and your, the speed in which you want to work and things. Yes, I have been taking a lot of treatment almost six years and um, reached a stage when my disease is stable. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, stage uh, two. And then I went to all different um, protocols for the treatment, which is first they did lumpectomy and then chemotherapy and radiation therapy. I was diagnosed with um, invasive lobular breast cancer in the summer of 2019. Uh, started off a um, regular mammogram, found a lump, which probably was a cyst because uh, the lobular cancer does not form lumps. So when they biopsied it, they actually found precancer cells and then through an MRI, and additional biopsies, they found the lobular cancer. Um, I, there were three spots of precancer, so um, in one breast, and so I opted for a double mastectomy. Um, they thought that I would not need radiation and definitely would not need chemo, so I was very happy because that meant I would not lose my hair. Um, when they removed, when they did the double mastectomy, the cancer instead of being three quarters of a centimeter was five and a half centimeters. So it went from, instead of the size of a grape, it was the size of an orange. And actually I was really lucky, I feel, that they found it in the first place because all three biopsies that had only shown precancer cells were in the midst of that cancerous area. I was diagnosed with cancer in May of 2019. I think it was May 6th. Um, my twin sister remembers the day because it affected her, but I mean, it affected me as well. <laughs> but uh, April, the end of April, I 
found my own cancer and knew in my heart that it was cancer and I'd already come to terms with it. When I went to um, my doctor's appointment and had her confirm it, just waited for her to tell me, you know, like she looked at me and I was like, yeah, you see it till you feel it too. And um, then it just, that got the ball rolling and officially diagnosed um, in May, May 6, 2019. I just knew like one day overnight was like, it was on top of my skin. I had breast cancer, had breast cancer and it was like bark on top of my skin. And it just appeared overnight. I guess I knew I had cancer, but then I got, I went through all, you know, went to my um, OBGYN and she waited for her to say something. Cause it was like a few days. I knew I was going to the doctor three days later and waited for her to notice. I didn't say anything. She was like, Hmm. And I was like, we just made eye contact. And I, we, I, she looked at me and I went. And so she was like, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna go have you see this breast surgeon or, you know, and have a consult and we're gonna send you downstairs to get labs. They did an ultrasound and a uh, mammogram. And we waited for, you know, I made chit chat, small talk with the ultrasound while I was watching the big black mass on the screen move around and just like okay and i guess i it, i guess it was the just the everyday like it felt until officially i went in the breast surgeon came and had like after all that labs went out and um they took pieces to send out and test and see if it was cancer and finally i guess when i sat there and she said she I remember the doctor um, came and said, it's a little bit of cancer. <laughs> I was like, and then, I, then it was as if a bomb went off and all I, I, she was talking, my husband was there, but all I could hear is the whole time. And even though I knew in my heart that it was cancer, it was like, okay, it's cancer. I do not have cancer, which I am very grateful for. My younger brother was diagnosed with multiple myeloma when he was 32. He was actually one of the youngest people diagnosed with that. And I'm happy to say that was 22 years ago. And despite all predictions, he is still with us. My dad was diagnosed with um, stage four sarcoma um, in 2019 in February 2019 and he had just had a short journey with cancer about six weeks from diagnosis till day of death so he passed away on March 23rd 2019 about 10 months before this project. I was uh, diagnosed in 20, 2016 but after I started having my chemotherapy, I started experiencing a lot of side effects. And at that time, we sort of thought the side effects were connected to the chemotherapy. But as it winds up, it was not. It was a staph infection, which in turn um, did some damage actually caused me to lose my left hip during this time. So I had to stop the chemo treatment and have the hip taken care of, which means I had a hip removal and did without a hip for four months. And then um, had a new hip put in and I was good to go right back over to the cancer side <laughs> and start uh, there. And I had a lumpectomy, which was successful. I have been on an oral uh, chemo drug for the last five years, and I've just been taken off of that. Uh, I didn't have any side effects from the chemo drug, which was good because I felt like I'd already had enough side effects of everything. So, uh, so that was my experience with cancer. I'm Kimberly Kirkland. I'm the director of the UAB Institute for Arts and Medicine. And I've been at UAB for 21 years and have been directing this program since we started it as a pilot project in 2013. There's a lot of growing research around arts and in healthcare, in medical education, in community, and arts in public health. And 
A lot of the benefits that are identified through the research include um, that of course it, it reduces uh, stress and anxiety, um, and it can reduce uh, depression, it can provide a positive distraction from medical problems um, and you know being in, in a healthcare environment. Other things uh, that it can, can help with is it can reduce a the perception of pain. Um, and it can actually be used um, for people who are experiencing chronic pain as an alternative to um, pharmacologicals by coming together with people who have some similar, you know, life experiences, um, normalizing different um, challenging experience, experiences can, can create just those, that connection um, that, that really does, as we know, as evidence tells us, lead to improved health. And that and, and engaging in that creative expression, having another outlet as, as opposed to just speaking or talking with someone, but being able to express yourself through movement or through monologue or through song is, is very powerful. And so by bringing those different things together, um, I really think that this project, Raising Our Voices, um, is, is a wonderful example of what arts and health can be. In the case of Raising Our Voices, we knew we wanted to work with the cancer community, meaning anyone impacted by cancer. It could be someone with a di recent diagnosis. It could be someone who has quote unquote beat cancer. It could be someone that lost someone to cancer and many other variations. So, okay, this is the population. So then I say to myself, okay, so then how do we take that and make that an artful production? I came in January before we, we came back in, in to do the project in 2020 and I was here for like five days and I met with lots of different groups and I told them about this project and that it was going to invite people impacted by cancer to come share their stories and we we're going to create a performance from it. And then when I came back and to see who in fact said, I'm okay, great, I'm going to try it, you know, I'm going to be in this. The process really starts once again with me finding ways to um, develop conversation starters in which I learn more about them and they learn more about one another simultaneously. And then from that, then I start to see what are the themes. You know, there happens to be a lot of people in this cast who have experienced breast cancer. And one of the women's stories was she's a breast cancer survivor. And she talked about when she had breast cancer, she had two friends, or maybe more than that, but a few friends that were also dealing with breast cancer. And they got to be very close and they got to, they'd go to lunch and they, you know, they feel comfortable talking to each other because they were all going through the same thing, you know? And so it was like a, it was a really uh, important su support system and friendship. Okay, and she says, and I decided I, I wanted to name us, so I named us Bosom Buddies. So that, uh, great, what a great, great story, great idea, okay. So then I think, well, I think we need to have something about that, you know? And it becomes a monologue for her, but then it becomes a song that everybody becomes a part of. And then as a director and as a theatrical person, I'm weighing things in terms of the overall show, things that are more poignant, perhaps a little bit, have more weight in terms of a dark color, and then things that are not less important, but might need to be lighter. And so in the case of Bosom Buddies, it's a kind of a light song, not a light subject, but just a, you know, a different way of, of addressing the material. So from her came that story, came that, commonality with a lot of people in the cast came the monologue I wrote for her and came the song. So that's an instance of how how does the person's story become part of the so-called show. The thing about the community work I do, and, and I'll say this anytime, here and anywhere, it's the same thing I do with children. I don't do something less because these people aren't professional performers. My bar will never be lowered. I mean, I'm not interested in producing that kind of work. I'm not interested in having an audience watch it. I, I, it has to be as excellent as it is with trained professionals. 
So I demand a lot of these people and my experience is the more you expect from people, the more they match it. You know, I can work with fifth graders who've never done a thing. And as soon as I say, you know what, all hundred, hundred of you are gonna do this thing and you're gonna do it well, and you're not gonna talk backstage and you remember your line and, you're, and Tom, you're gonna remember to run across with Abby. And you know what, they do it. But it's about setting an expectation. Um, and because they're invested, you know, because it's, it's, it's their show, it's about them. So I always, you know, in the case of these monologues, these are people who've never spoken on stage. They, I mean, they probably have never even been on stage, you know, any of them. I mean, with ex a few exceptions. But you know what, they're all doing the thing. And then, often what happens in these instances is people see this thing and they go, are you telling me she's not really an actress? This was my first experience. I walked into the, to the information session on January 20th with zero, zero experience. And that's what's been great about this is that for people like me with no background, I think actually I'm the only one, but they've been so kind and um, kind of forgiving with, with that and knowing yeah, my limitations, which has been good both ways because it's pushed me to do harder and to try harder. And while bonding with this group, you know, of other cancer survivors and dancers, and just to become this kind of organic group that, that has come up with this beautiful, beautiful production. I just really honestly feel when I'm on stage, like, you know, the preschooler in the, <laughs> in the recital and I'm having a blast. When I was little, I used to dance, um, ballet dance. And then when I was in college for my undergrad degree, we just did movement. I took tap dancing, that's about it. I have always loved to dance. I am not really a dancer. I'm more of a mover that tries to look like maybe she can dance. And I actually taught dance and movement and at Lakeshore Foundation. And so I guess I'd say all my life. It's funny doing this, I've realized how much I've missed it and how sore I am. It's been quite a challenge because of course I'm not a dancer or a singer. As I said, I love to observe art in all forms. Uh, but this is such a great group of people. Uh, it's been a great experience. It was the first time to, to get to meet a whole new group of people. And we have so much in common. And I think it's just another thing that connects us all together. The more you find out, of pe out about people and have a conversation with them, uh, it's just very rewarding. I wouldn't categorize myself as a dancer. I don't think, I don't think every, I don't think anyone would mistake me for a dancer. Because when you say dancer, I'm thinking you train to be a dancer. So, I'm, I'm a mover. The expression of dancing is a, is a way more than a thousand words. Uh, it's a connection between others uh, or between two partners and uh, it express happiness it express you can express uh, sadness you can express your anger you can express anything in that move you don't have to say a word and that's the beauty of dancing i've always gone to dance as like a very expressive art form and use like I'm having a bad day or like I need to like, like I can't talk about something any longer or I've always like gone to the studio and like moved and that's just been a way of expression for me and an outlet. And so being on a stage with people that aren't my age, aren't my ethnicity, aren't like, it's like, such a diverse community, but we all have the same goal and we all want to share the same message. And so I, I feel empowered and I feel like 
it's almost bringing me a lot of peace. For me, dancing and moving has always been a way to sort of express myself, even before verbalizing. Um, it's a way to reduce anxiety. It's when I feel the most at home and most myself um, and most free. Uh, and yeah, it continues to be the outlet that I go to to process things. Throughout this process, of dancing with this project, with raising our voices, I kept using the excuse, but I'm not a dancer, I, I can't do it, I'm not a dancer. So finally one day we were all circled up and I said, I just need to say something right now. I need to proclaim that I'm a dancer. So I stopped using that as an excuse. And so people are ribbing me a little bit and encourage me now. What I've learned over the last 26 years of, of being in cancer support groups and, and seeing other people heal and seeing other people pass away is that there is healing when, when, when two or more uh, cancer survivors get together or two or more caregivers get together and they get to share a common experience, strength and hope, you know? And there's healing. So when this project came around, I, I'm like, I'm all in. Let me know what to do. Arts and medicine is very effective to heal the entire person. I think through music, through creativity, poetry, speaking, storytelling, painting, dancing, acting, the body can catch up to all the science and the medical things that it has to go through and process what's happening. So it makes for a more effective healing. I never would have really thought that arts were so healing. This was the first thing that I did with Arts and Medicine and since then, a lot of the, through, through the connections that I've made in this class, um, like Elizabeth and her creative writing, like the coloring classes with lettering, I've taken a couple of her classes and she has several of them online through the Arts and Medicine website. And it's, it's so interesting and just to do that, it's so calming. And it, you know, it, it just takes your mind away from whatever, whatever is going on that is negative and it's such an escape. And it's, and it's easy, but it's not something that you would do on your own. Definitely a believer that arts is a healer in, in many ways. And um, I've seen that now you know, firsthand how much of a difference that makes in both my life and, and in other people's lives as well. The art definitely aids in the healing, again, because there are emotions that, um, that are hard to express in words, that the movement and the dance can express for you, that the singing expresses, and even more sort of being in community with other people who, share that same story. And being in community with people who understand so that you don't, that doesn't have to be the central part of the story. They all know where you're coming from. And so, so in that way, it's really freeing too, because you can not talk about that. And yet it's still that shared thread that runs through. Well, I actually am an artist in residence at UAB Hospital, and my primary form of art is storytelling. And what I've realized in the years of doing that is that art, as cliche as this may sound, and it's even gonna rhyme, art is the way to people's hearts. And that's where I feel like we truly connect with one another. And just today I was with a patient and I told her a story and then she goes, I, let me show you what I do. And she shared her art. She takes her pill bottles and caps and she paints them and makes them into little cakes and furniture for a dollhouse. And I felt like, it really almost doesn't matter what the art is, it's just this little gateway opens and then somebody says, well, let me show you mine. And then we're humans, we're not sick, we're not in a hospital, we're just, we're just humans together. When COVID hit, what was everyone's outlet? Like listening to music, drawing, like all of these activities that involve the arts and I think it's a very 
beautiful way to heal creating something like creating something from your hurt or even your happiness just or your loss or just anything i think that it's very healing and to do that with other people is more healing people that are going through the same thing or listening rather than being heard is also very important in this art form so yeah what i can get from listening to others and watching others heal from their art that they're creating is very inspiring helps me heal well i think they both have um their roles um, and I think we're still coming to understanding what the role of art in healing is. I've been involved in the field of arts and health for almost 30 years now. Um, we created a program in uh, 1992 for caregivers called Caring for the Caregiver um, at a time when I didn't know arts and medicine was a thing. We just happened to do that. Uh, it became something that became our signature program, and we have done those workshops all over the world. Um, and as a result, I'm very schooled now in the field of arts and medicine. I also am schooled in the, in the ways it's not, hasn't grown into itself yet. Uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't found its way into our culture in particular. Other countries in the world, we're further along. They're farther along in that understanding for sure. Um, it is, I mean, you know, you've got a program here at UAB, uh, you know, an Arts and Medicine Institute, incredible. And then you can go someplace and they don't even know what you're talking about. So we're at that place in our country, I believe. Um, so thank you to the places like here, right? Um, I always say it's like those thousand points of light, you know, you gotta start somewhere. Um, so I think there's that. And then of course we all sort of understand what the science part of medicine is because we know what a doctor is and we have experiences with that. And right now they're sort of parallel silos in a lot of cases. I happen to think that, that you know, it's called the art of medicine, but frankly, it's not practiced that way very often. When it is, it's the best it can be. So I think when medicine is good, it's very good. And when it's bad, it's not so great. Um, and I think art, can strengthen it in a, in a symbiotic way. So if, if it's integrated, if we, if we begin to understand how to integrate arts into healing practices, not in place of medicine, certainly never in place of science, but as a partner in the healing process, that is the best equation, I think, for healing. I think healthcare and public health and even medical education, so many more people are now starting to understand the importance of the arts um, and humanities uh, in partnership with science and medicine. We know for, for years and years, the research that comes out around, um, around healthcare and science, and of course, the development of vaccinations and surgeries and cutting edge techniques to heal the body. But what's also so important for our whole well-being is, is, is really addressing the whole person. So the mind, the body and the spirit. If you look at uh, the definition of health by the World Health Organization, um, they define it as not merely the absence of disease, but it's the health of the whole individual, the mind, body, and spirit. So it's it's all of those dimensions of well-being because we can have a healthy body, but if if we're not, uh, you know, addressing the needs of our mind and our spirit, we don't have that health. And of course, the opposite goes as well. You know, if you you know you could have a healthy mind, or but if you don't have a healthy body, then then our well-being, um, you know, isn't isn't. Uh, optimal. More and more we're seeing um, the sciences embracing the arts and of course the, the arts embracing the sciences as well because you have to have the balance. When I'm creating, irrespective of what sort of creating I'm doing, whether whether it's some kind of art or photography or, or dance 
when I'm creating, I'm healing. I know that now. There was a, there was a time in Germany, uh, I took my wife to Germany to, to go for an alternative therapy after uh, Hope had been given up here uh, in the States. And um, there was a 24 hour art, art you know, workshop that was open in the hospital. And I found myself one night at 2 a.m. just couldn't sleep and I just wandered into this and I did art until the sun came up. It was like a timeless experience. And in that, in those few hours, I felt like I was healing, you know, as a caregiver and as a patient. I felt, I felt when I was creating, I was healing. And so when I dance out here, it's not about me being a good dancer. It's about creating. What am I creating? I'm creating healing for myself. I'm participating in healing with other people, for other people. So that's the, that's the exhilaration for me. Art heals. This experience, raising our voices, which is a lot of movement and acting and uh, speaking, it is very, uh, it's a very good closure to being cancer free, which I am. It has allowed me to meet a whole new group of people that I didn't know before and hear their stories and their struggles and to really celebrate who we are as people. We aren't defined by our diseases, but we certainly have been through them and everybody has a different path. It's meant a lot to me, honestly, because it's like I have a part of my grandmother with me. You know, like I feel like she drew me to this and like I've never met her, but I feel like I get to tell her story through my movement. This experience has meant, it's meant the world it's meant the world to me. Um, I've made so many new friends and just memories and, and things that I, you know, things that I never thought that I would, would be able to do, such as dance and sing with a group and perform. My goodness, perform here at the Alice Stevens Center? Who gets to do that <laughs> except train, you know, train professionals? Oh, this experience is joy sharing and meeting people which is absolutely essential to me and the people around me i have no words to thank them and to tell them that look you have made my made me happy by coming together this raising our voice program actually brings back lots of memory in my mind uh, in my personal upbringing and my childhood memories. The way to meet other people and listening their stories, listening their sufferings as well, the, uh, how they went through on their cancer stages. That experience actually, if you do not go that path, you will never know. It's the only way when a survivor can only understand other survivors. There's a no way. My, my mom, dad, they love me to death. They will never understand what I went through. But my fellow survivor will understand more. I think one of the most incredible things in participating in this process is the strength that I've seen in other people. And I'm not sure that everybody feels that strength in themselves, but we all sort of feel that strength from each other. This experience has been a blessing. I have made friends that I will keep for a lifetime. Um, it's been an opportunity for me to get back on the stage again. Um, and that, that I uh, am really thankful for. It definitely has helped in a lot of ways. Cause like I can come to rehearsal and almost like, like feel, like feel my mare and And also it's helping me, <laughs> like, 
Like not to like be like my problems don't matter, but like that's how I feel like there's so many people going through so many things and it's like my problems are this big. So if <laughs> like it takes me out of my bubble that I sometimes like put myself in, but just gaining that insight was very and still is very important. And to have like, I don't know, I feel like some of these people are like grandma figures to me. And being far away from home, it's nice to have like a mom or grandma hug, like walking into rehearsal after a long day. <laughs> It is meant, I've been so proud of my director is Kimberly Kirkland and I just adore her and I'm just so proud that she said when this all came to a crashing halt in 2019 or 20 or 3000, whenever that was, we, we are going to do this. And I feel like it would have been so easy to say, well, we thought we could, but we can't. And being with these people again and to see people who didn't have hair have hair and see that they're finished with their treatments and how much better they feel and how healthy they are and that they're still with us is just amazing. And I just, I love the people in the company that have come and shared their expertise and their love of dance and just the laughter and camaraderie. This experience, it followed on the heels of losing my dad to cancer, to sarcoma, um, about a year prior when we first started working with the cast in 2020. Um, and at that point, I hadn't yet connected with other people um, who had an experience of losing someone to cancer. And for me, being part of this performance, it reflected exactly what I was experiencing in my life, which was that there were deep lows to the, the grief of losing someone to cancer, and that there was also this deeper connection that had opened up in me. Um, having gone through a, my first really significant loss, um, I started to have heightened emotions and um, and to feel connected to other people and, and to their own stories of loss in ways that I hadn't been able to empathize with before. So being part of the project just shortly after that experience, um, it helped me to find not a, a reason for losing my dad to cancer, but some degree of meaning because now there was connection with other people who could understand some of what I had been through. This experience has been just a wonderful um, reminder of the power of the arts, the power of community, the power of movement, the power of dance. Um, again, this is the first project I've taken part in um, since COVID began. Um, and, and so it's just wonderful to be reminded of how essential this is, um, both personally to myself, but also to the world. Um, and, and just to get that message out there and to share you know, what we do and projects like um, raising our voices um, with a larger community. Um, and so excited to be able to do that. This experience has been both joyful and it has been sad. Because the truth is that cancer takes people. And oftentimes before it takes people, it's very grueling. And there are also victories, you know? There are victories in, there are victories in survival. There are victories in death even, and it's hard because the grief process is such a, a, such a wilderness, you know? And everybody has their own process in the grief. So there are people that are in grief right now. And what this does is it brings all of that up. Jana, my, my, my late wife has been gone 
for, for eight and a half years. And there are moments on the stage during rehearsal where I, it feels like it was last week. And there are also moments that it is exhilarating and joyful to be out there with other survivors or other people who have lost their loved ones. And I truly believe that Jan is with me on, on many different levels. And uh, I, I'm sure she would be so happy about this project. She would just be over the moon with it. For me, it used to be, how am I gonna survive this? How am I gonna survive this? How am I gonna survive this? And we're all trying to survive and we're all dying. How am I gonna live? How am I gonna live? I am what I give my attention to. What am I gonna, where am I gonna put my attention for the remainder of my life? Whether that's a few months, a few years, or decades and decades. And so I, I claim, after everything I've been through, I claim joy. You know, I'm not happy that I lost those folks. I'm not happy that I went through what I went through. And I still am a very happy person. I'm satisfied and I continue to grow. I'm not letting, I'm not letting that other part dictate where I am.